Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our webcast, It's All in Your Head. My name is Rita and I'm the moderator of this webcast. Today Dr. Swingle will be talking about autistic spectrum disorders which have risen exponentially over recent years. We will be with you for about an hour and I'd like to encourage you to ask questions or make comments anytime during this one hour talk. All you need to do is to click on the chat tab located in the bottom section of the control panel and type your questions in the chat box. We will have three short breaks and I will use these to read all of your questions out loud for Dr. Swingle to answer. So who is Dr. Swingle? As some of you may know, Dr. Swingle was titular full professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to moving to Vancouver. A fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Dr. Swingle was lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, attending psychologist at McLean's Hospital in Boston, where he also was coordinator of the Clinical Psychophysiology Service. Dr. Swingle is registered psychologist in British Columbia, certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. His newest book, Biofeedback for the Brain, was published by Rutgers University Press. The book is available at www.soundhealthproducts.com. Again, that is www.soundhealthproducts.com. And without further ado, here is Dr. Swingle. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, everybody, to our monthly uh, webinar uh, webcast series. Today, we are going to be talking about <coughs> autistic spectrum disorders. And as Rita said, uh, it has risen exponentially over the last <coughs> uh, few years. And there are all kinds of speculations about you know, why we're seeing greater frequency of this disorder. We're not going to concern ourselves with that issue at the, uh, at this, uh, during this webcast. We're going to look at it, what it looks like in the brain, <coughs> and secondarily, what we can do to uh, help treat this uh, this condition. Okay, let's just start right off here. Uh, this is these are the data that we have collected from the brain assessment of a 39 month old autistic child. Now, let me just go back a second here. I don't want to go the other way. What I'm going to be talking about are five areas in the brain. And we're going to be talking about the frontal part of the brain, which is, as you all know, the executive portion of the brain implicated in absolutely everything. There's a pattern that we tend to see in children that have uh, autistic spectrum disorders. Uh, we're also going to be looking at what's going on uh, over what's called the sensory motor cortex. That's roughly the center point in the brain running from ear to ear. Uh, that is an area responsible for sensation, perception, motor movements. We're also going to be looking at the back of the brain uh, and also the frontal midline. Okay, now. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, present a lot of data, uh, which I tend to do, to uh, try to explain what it is that we see in these uh, brain maps of uh, kids with these kinds of disorders, and adults too, and what it is that we can do to uh, try to uh, correct some of these problems. Now, the first thing I want to point out is this child is only 39 months of age. One of the things that we have developed here in the Vancouver Clinic is a procedure that we can use to treat very, very young children, and also those children who, under general uh, conditions, would not be able to do brainwave biofeedback. That is, they are uh, uh, too disturbed, uh, uh, too uh, problematic, they have too uh, uh, too much difficulty attending to something like the feedback uh, screen so that we have to use non-volitional procedures. And I'll go over that in detail, but I just wanted to point out that a lot of clinics will tell you that they can't do anything for a child until they're about five or six years of age. That's just not true. We've treated kids 
that are two months old for these severe, severe seizure conditions. Okay, now the first thing I want to point out, remember where CZ is. That's the place right in the center of the head, on the top of the head. <clears throat> we are looking here at the ratio between very slow activity and fast activity in the brain. And we get a ratio from that. It's just a slow, fast ratio. Now, <clears throat> that ratio for this child is 4.2. We want that ratio below about 2.5, somebody this uh, this age. And what that means is that that area of the brain is hypoactive. Uh, in kids that have uh, ADHD, that is the hyperactive form of ADD, they have elevated <clears throat> slow fast ratios. <clears throat> that is, that area of the brain is hypoactive and they're bouncing around climbing off the walls because they're self-medicating. They're trying to stimulate the motor area in the brain and that's what the bouncing around is. Uh, so you can see that the uh, this mother reported that this child was severely hyperactive. The other thing is at that same location we look at a waveform referred to as the sensory motor rhythm, SMR. And as we will be discussing in some detail as we move on, uh, children with autism have a much higher probability of having a seizure disorder. Uh, it runs almost 30%. <clears throat> so uh, this is a ratio that tells us the vulnerability of the child to a seizure disorders. And <clears throat> in this child's case, that ratio is 6.14, which is very high. We want it below three or so. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to point out, we'll be going through a lot of this as we move on, but I'm going to take it a little bit at a time. The other thing that we almost always find in autism is a disparity in the front part of the brain in which activity in the brain referred to as alpha, 8 to 12 cycles a second, is considerably higher on the right relative to the left. Now what that is, is the social skill aspect. Uh, kids with the oppositional defiance disorder, children with autism, uh, children with poor social skills uh, show that disparity. And what it means uh, is that that area of the brain has not is not efficient in terms of skill acquisition. That's uh, and also the whole concept of theory of the self resides in the right prefrontal orbital cortex. That is the ability to recognize other people as emotional beings. Okay. Now, what have we just gone over? The first thing that we looked at is the frontal cortex. We find that this area in the brain where the theory of the self and social skills and all that sort of uh, very important skill uh, development is located and there's an elevation of a waveform that means that that area is offline too much. I guess that's the best way of wording that. The second thing that we find is up on the top of the head, right over the sensory motor strip, runs right across the, the top of the head, like so. And what we find is that there's elevated slow frequency in this region in the brain, which means that the, the brain is hypoactive in that area and the child is, has elevated uh, activity levels to try to uh, self-stem. Okay, now, <clears throat> the second case, <clears throat> a female, so uh, one of the uh, notions that we have is autism is primarily a male disorder, and it is true, we see a lot more males than females, but we see a lot of females, and this uh, little girl is a bit over four years of age. Now, what do we see? First thing we see is that we do not, in her case, have uh, that elevated slow frequency on top of the brain. We do have what looks like it may be a mild predisposition to uh, some seizure issues. <clears throat> 
she has that <clears throat> disparity in the front part of the brain in terms of the alpha density being considerably greater on the right relative to the left, so she has that social skill issue. And you can see the mother here in, identifies social skills as a problem, but she nowhere in here is she talking about hyperactivity. And that's consistent because that area in the brain is not showing elevated slow frequency. Now the second thing I want to point out here, moving along to other areas in the brain that are important in autism, <clears throat> is that FZ, which is the front part of the brain right in the middle, there's a relationship of very, very high frequency activity, high beta gamma, 28 to 40 cycles a second. And, and the ratio of that to beta, 16 to 25 cycles a second, gives us a measure of the activity of an area in the brain referred to as the anterior cingulate gyrus. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. This is the area of the brain associated with obsessive compulsive uh, uh, behaviors. And uh, what we find in children with, AD, with uh, autism, autism spectrum disorders, is that this area is inevitably hyperactive. And that's what's associated with the perseverative behavior that you see in so many autistic kids. And we have a direct measure of that. Now, this is a sagittal slice of the head. That is, we've cut the brain in half. And you're looking at uh, the center uh, area of that. Uh, this is the front part over here. And here's the back of the brain. And the area that is of concern here is the cingulate gyrus, which is this structure right here. But we're interested primarily in the anterior portion of that right there, the anterior cingulate gyrus. And when that area is hot, as we say, hyperactive, <clears throat> then that's associated with getting something on your mind. You can't get it out. And so... Uh, the traditional OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder client, will show marked hyperactivity in this area of the brain, among some other things, of course. And this can be a problem for folks with depression if this is uh, an elevated area because they get depressed thoughts on the mind and they can't get rid of them. In an autistic child, this is responsible for some of those peculiar perseverative behaviors that you see in which an autistic child may develop a... Uh, a very profound interest in something like a microwave oven. And that's all they talk about is a microwave oven or some event that's happened. And they constantly perseverate on that event. That's the area of the brain associated with that activity. And where I discovered that was when I was over at McLean Hospital and <clears throat> uh, chatting with the neurosurgeons over there who used to do what they call cingulotomies, in which they would sever this area of the brain uh, for very severe OCD clients. And I was fiddling around with uh, electrodes trying to see whether I could capture that. And there's a site that I found and a, a, an equation, which is the one I just showed you, that gives us the activity of that area. And the breakthrough was we could treat this area with a surface electrode. That was the major breakthrough. OK. A lot of kids with uh, autism, uh, uh, autism spectrum, spectrum disorders come in with this diagnosis. Pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. OK. And the point I'm making is the labels are meaningless, really. Uh, they don't tell us what to do. Uh, what we have to do is have a look at what the brain's telling us. OK. So again, up on top of the head, uh, we have uh, the uh, elevated slow frequency. Uh, in terms of the area of the brain that we were just talking about, uh, here it is, 0.97. That's really pretty hot. OK. Now, one of the things that you'll find uh, with uh, children that show this particular pattern, 
uh, and of course that disparity in the front part of the brain in which alpha is higher on the right relative to the left is loud talking and a lot of autistic kids uh, they have a very very loud voice and uh, remarkably so and families uh, try to uh, uh, do some behavioral work on that in which they ask the child to use his uh, house voice for example uh, when they're out in a, in a uh, restaurant and the child is, is, is talking uh, in a very loud uh, voice. Okay, so we're seeing very consistent patterns here. Okay, <clears throat> another uh, uh, child with again autism, eight years of age. Here you have that elevated slow frequency again. Now, another thing I want to point out is this is the back of the brain, and one of the things that we often find in uh, autism, and particularly in Asperger's, uh, is elevated slow frequency in the back of the brain under eyes open conditions, and that's kind of like fugue state. Uh, a child gets into their own world, and it's more than daydreaming. It's very hard to bring them out, but again, if you look at the standard pattern, Elevated slow frequency up over the sensory motor cortex. <clears throat> Hyperactivity of the anterior cingulate. There it is right there. <clears throat> and the uh, imbalance in front part of the brain. Now there's another way that can, uh, can happen in which the uh, left side of the brain is slowed relative to the right. Uh, I, I'm sorry, the other way around. The right is uh, slowed relative to the left, and we're having that uh, marker right here. Okay, so uh, summary of some of the things we've just been talking about in terms of autism spectrum, spectrum disorder. First of all, elevated activity of the anterior cingulate gyrus, frontal alpha imbalance, now, a couple of other issues here that I'd like to discuss. <clears throat> the first is what is referred to as the imitative neuron system, the mirror neur neuron system. And what this is, is the system that's associated with helping the child learn by observing others. The, we have found that this system is inefficient in the autistic child, that is, they don't learn by simply observing, or they're learning by observing other people. It's very inefficient. So we have a mechanism for uh, improving that uh, system, for lighting it up. The second issue that's very important is habituation. We're one of the few clinics in Canada that will accept very, very severely disabled uh, autistic kids. And to try to get an electrode on a child to even do the measurements that I've just been discussing might take eight or ten sessions because the child is just terrified and it takes a while to habituate them, make them feel comfortable with the, uh, uh, the procedures that are going on here. And tasking is something I'll talk about later in which we actually teach the child, put him, uh, have him perform activities while the area of the brain responsible for that activity is under treatment. So again, what we just went over is uh, uh, the front part of the brain, the right prefrontal orbital cortex, where social skills and theory of self reside. We went over the area right over the, the, uh, the brain from one ear to the other, the sensory motor cortex that's usually hypoactive, uh, which is responsible for the hyperactivity of the child. Also the sensory motor rhythm in this area, which is responsible for low seizure threshold. We also talked about elevated slow frequency in this part of the brain, which is why some of these kids get caught in what we call fugue states. And then, of course, the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is right in there. And again, there's your anterior cingulate gyrus. 
Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and this is our first break. I will start with a few announcements and we'll also address some of the questions that you sent to us. For those of you healthcare professionals out there, we are finalizing our fall schedule for Dr. Swingle's workshops. Last weekend, when fin we finished one here in Vancouver, last month we did two, one in Germany and one in UK. And we are now working on upcoming workshops in Western Canada, Trinidad, and possibly New Zealand. So Dr. Swingle's methods are finding its way all over the world. If you would like to be notified when the next workshop happens, you can email me Rita at swingleandassociates.com. You can also see my email address on your screen. And for those of you who are not on our mailing list, you can add your name to it by going to our website, www.swingleandassociates.com, and subscribe to our newsletter on our homepage. We send out these newsletters monthly, and we also email event announcements. Our next webcast will happen on Saturday, May 7th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, and we will be talking about depression. Oh, I think that's going to be a popular topic. Okay, enough of me talking. I see we have a few questions. Dr. Swingle, I am confused about the difference between autism and Asperger's. Is Asperger's high-functioning autism? What is meant by high-functioning? Let's see. Let me turn my mic on. Okay. Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. Uh, the autism, the ASD, Autistic Spectrum Disorder, uh, covers all of these things. Now, uh, what we mean by high-functioning autism is that the child is able to function in regular classrooms uh, with uh, some assistance in terms of social skills, uh, that some of the issues associated with the uh, autism may be preventing the child from efficient learning of, of some particular areas, <clears throat> but nonetheless uh, uh, responds well to remedial training and so forth. Uh, Asperger's is not, strictly speaking, high-functioning autism. It's a separate condition. <clears throat> I think the best analogy I can use is the autistic child, the, the truly autistic child <clears throat> doesn't make eye contact with you, doesn't respond to you because you don't exist as an emotional being. So when they look at you, they're looking right through you. The Asperger's child really wants to interact with you, but that area of the brain that we were talking about, the right prefrontal orbital cortex, is not functioning efficiently. So they just do not have social skills, social awareness. They're not able to read social skills and so forth. So those are the children that are standing on your toes with their face right in your, in your face. Uh, they want to make contact, but they, their social skills, uh, they just don't have social skills necessary to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, we treat them based on what the... Uh, what the brain maps tell us, so that you get a lot of overlap between these conditions in terms of brain activity, and both are addressable with neurotherapy. Okay, and uh, where would you begin in training autistic children? Well, if we have one that's screaming and uh, thrashing about on the floor, the first thing that we would do to treat them is to get them so that they're quiet and feel comfortable and safe and so forth so that we can get an electrode on. <clears throat> uh, typically what we do is we go after the waveforms that are preventing the child from interacting socially. Uh, and so for example, if we have these marked elevations of slow frequency, where the child is so hyperactive that it's very difficult to get them to 
be uh, uh, responsive to what you're doing, that would be the first thing that we would go after. But again, it's driven by what the brain is telling us. Has there been any research using movement and music to help children to change their brain waves? Oh, yes, absolutely. There's some wonderful uh, research that's been done in the area of music. In fact, there was a conference just three weeks ago at the uh, uh, New York Academy of Sciences in New York, and they had some really heavy hitters there in terms of the folks that have been doing this research on music and brain plasticity. Uh, people like uh, Ledoux at uh, NYU and, uh, and some other folks that have been working with things like Mozart, for example. There's a lot of uh, data on the cadences of Mozart uh, and uh, the beneficial effect it has. Okay, and we have time for one more question before we move on. For a child who is 10 years old and extremely autistic, is there a way to help them when they will barely sit still? How would you treat a student like this? Again, the first thing to do is uh, to habituate them. <clears throat> uh, and the, uh, the uh, first thing is to give the parents some electrodes so that they can uh, work with the child at home, getting them comfortable uh, with the electrodes on. They use reinforcement procedures for that. But I was, again, I was uh, pointing out earlier that we have developed methods for dealing with uh, ch children who could not vol volitionally participate. These are the brain driving techniques, which I'll be speaking about in just a few minutes. Okay, so get rid of that. Okay, uh, a lot of uh, what I'm going to be talking about, by the way, is in fact in uh, the book that Rita uh, spoke about earlier, Biofeedback for the Brain, and that's available on our website, local bookstores and Rutgers. And if you want a mother's account of this, you can uh, go to epilepsymoms.com and pick up the book by Arlene Martel. Uh, she has a chapter in there, as you can see, on neurotherapy and uh, meeting me and so forth and so on. What a courageous woman. Uh, Adam had uh, epilepsy and autism. Remember I said that the probability is very high that a child with autism is... Uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, seizure disorders. Uh, Arlene was told when Adam was, I don't know, six years of age or something like that, to put him in a crash helmet and institutionalize him. She said, nonsense. And uh, that's a picture of Adam in his tuxedo graduating from high school. He's now in university, by the way. By the way. So I think this is uh, uh, Arlene did everything. She tried everything, and what she has in her book and on her website, just some helpful thoughts for parents who are facing the uh, these challenges and also the problems with a non-responsive uh, healthcare uh, uh, operation. Here's a. <clears throat> Adam's uh, story has been written up in a lot of places. This was uh, the Peace. Hey, we didn't spell Peace right. Peace Arch News. <clears throat> That's a paper out in uh, White Rock. This is a picture that was drawn by one of our autistic kids. Now, she didn't copy this. She does this by the hundreds, these pictures by the hundreds. But what I'd like to point out is look at the social interaction that's going on here. This child ha is uh, quite severely uh, uh, problematic in the area of social interaction, but if this doesn't look like something's there just trying to get out, you know, that's always the way I've read her, uh, these cartoons that she does. And every one of them has that social interaction. Interesting. Okay, brain driving. Now, I spoke earlier about the uh, 
procedures that we developed that permit us to treat very, very young infants uh, and also children that cannot volitionally participate in regular brainwave biofeedback. And as the uh, earlier uh, person asked in the question, uh, how, what do we do with uh, a, uh, a uh, very hyperactive 10-year-old uh, uh, child who has problems sitting still? Well, we do brain driving. This is <coughs> A, a uh, measurement of brain activity. This is actually a recording of an actual brain assessment. And what we have here is the raw signal. That's the raw brain wave coming out of a specific location, in this case right on top of the head. And then we have theta, alpha, and beta. So theta, very slow waves. And then Alpha is a bit faster, but it's considered a slow wave, and then beta is much faster yet. Now, the brain wave should look like this. The spectrum should look like this. That is, the slower the frequency, the higher the amplitude. And that's exactly what you see here. Now, this is fine. You know, that's the kind of thing that you would expect. It bounces around, of course. But you have that general trend from slow frequency, highest amplitude, down to fast frequency, lowest amplitude. Now I'm going to show you some data associated with this area right in here, the alpha frequencies. And this is some of the earlier work that was done in the 1940s at McGill University. Okay. <clears throat> This is the alpha that I was just showing you, okay? Okay, this area right in here, and it's this waveform that we're going to be talking about, okay? So <clears throat> this is alpha, and <clears throat> if you present a sound, nothing much happens to the alpha. If you present light, alpha blocks, as we say. And that is when you turn lights on, and it can be flashing lights, which it was in this case, what happens is the alpha decreases. That is, the strength of it decreases. Now, if you uh, combine the sound with the light after a period of time, if you only present the sound, you will get a suppression of the alpha amplitude. Any of you folks that have taken basic psychology know the work of Ivan Pavlov, uh, who trained dogs how to salivate when he rang a bell. We all remember that. Well, that's exactly what's going on here. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's very interesting is if you have repetition of the light that's blocking that alpha, you can see it really clearly here. And you do this, in this case, for 54 trials, that is 54 occasions, and then you don't do it. Where it's expecting that to happen, you will get a, a blunting of the alpha. So this is really valuable information because what this tells us is brainwave activity responds to learning just the way any other system in the body does. And that's a breakthrough. Okay. Now, <clears throat> part of what I do is looking around for stimuli like the light that has a demonstrable effect on brain activity. And we do a lot of work with sounds. And the only reason I'm putting up this, this is my favorite testimonial. This is uh, uh, when we had a specific sound referred to now as Omni that suppresses theta amplitude. And it was on uh, tapes, not CD, but in any event, 
this is a statement from a, uh, an elementary school teacher. The two teachers who had the, their original problem was they only ordered two tapes. The two teachers who had the most immediate and dramatic results with their students would not loan their tapes for the rest of the staff. I just love that. <laughs> okay, so this is what happens if you expose the brain to this omni harmonic, and it's just a sound that sounds like shh, where we have a lot of sounds embedded in that. It suppresses the slow frequency amplitude. Now remember one of the problems with the ASD child is they have elevated slow frequency up on top of the brain and what we want to do is get that down. We want to reduce that. This is what that sound does. Right across the front, right, right across the midline of the brain. Now remember we were talking about FZ and we were talking about CZ and it reduces on average by 22 percent. As soon as you apply, that is, expose the child to the sound. That's the kind of change you get, 22% roughly all over the brain. Now here, you can have a very nice uh, uh, pictorial of what the hyperactive child looks like, which is very similar to the autistic child in terms of the hyperactive dimension. This is that theta activity we were talking about. Now here's the normal theta activity and here's the activity of the hyperactive child. Here's the high frequency under normal conditions and here's the high frequency of the hyperactive child. So if you combine these and that's that ratio we're talking about, the ratio of the amplitude of this to the amplitude of that, you can see that this number is going to be considerably greater than that number. Now look what Omni... Hmm. Okay, uh, here's our second break, and I'd like to take this opportunity to announce our next webcast, It's All in Your Head, which we will broadcast on Saturday, May 7th at our regular time, which is 10 a.m. Pacific time, and we will talk about depression. If you would like to be on it, you can email me at rita at swingleandassociates.com, and I'll send you the login information. And please don't be shy. Give me your comments or suggestions about our our webcast. We welcome your opinion, so let us know. I will now go straight to your questions. I have uh, plenty of them here, and uh, this one is a uh, rather long question. I am father of autistic child, eight years old, from Greece, and his symptoms mainly are inattention, stress, learning difficulties, diet problems, social interaction with other children. With the symptoms above, what are your records working with NBF and BFD and metacognition to treatment. What are the brain regions underlying the above symptoms? And that's exactly what we've been talking about. <clears throat> the uh, hyperactivity uh, is associated with elevated slow frequency on top of the brain. Uh, that's also associated with inattentiveness. Stress is usually elevated activity of the left side of the brain relative to the right and beta amplitude. The social is the, exactly what we've been talking about, and that is where the right prefrontal orbital cortex has elevated alpha relative to the left. Hit rate for this is really good. Uh, and, and if you have a, a, a good neurotherapist in your area, uh, I would strongly advise you to, uh, to uh, add neurotherapy to whatever else you're doing. Diet, of course, is critical in terms of uh, working with these kids, in terms of any kind of uh, sensitivities they might have. The other thing is uh, you might drop uh, Rita a note because we do have uh, home treatment available in which uh, we set you up with uh, equipment that we access from the Vancouver office and you do the tr uh, we do the treatment from here. Can children with autism or Asperger's look after themselves when they become adults? <clears throat> uh, it all depends on severity and success of treatment. <clears throat> Generally speaking, <clears throat> uh, the uh, children that we treat uh, do become independent. Uh, there are 
some conditions in which the autism is also <laughs> combined with severe developmental delay. So, you know, aut autistic kids, like anybody else, uh, they have comorbid conditions. And if the other comorbid condition is a disabling condition, then they will respond just the way anybody else does in terms of independence. Okay, we'll move on. Okay. Now. So, <clears throat> this is the uh, kind of glasses that we use when we're doing brain driving. So, <clears throat> the uh, glasses, the child can look through the glasses, and these are the lights. So we can turn lights on and off at any time we want, but the child can still look through the glasses and they can play games or they can uh, be reading or we can be interacting with them. This is what the brain driving uh, preparation looks like in one of the treatment rooms. There are the glasses that I just showed you. And the child has a screen and the trainer has a screen. When we're working with adults, this is what brain driving looks like. We might be giving sound. We might be using lights. We also do electrical stimulation of acupuncture points, which we do not do with children. <clears throat> uh, tasking, we have the child do something like, in this case, write. Uh, while the area of the brain responsible for that activity is under treatment. <clears throat> and in this case, this is the first session. The only thing we were able to get out of the child was he wrote his first name. Second session. Third session. <clears throat> okay, so this is the uh, after five uh, sessions. Okay. We do uh, some other cooperative things. This is a very early slide. This is oh, 20 years old, I guess, when I was doing work with autistic kids in a, a school that was associated with uh, my department at the University of Ottawa when I was chairman there. And this is, uh, as you can see, the uh, uh, horse ride that you see in a lot of uh, supermarket or malls put a quarter in, well, I guess it's not a quarter anymore, I put some money in and the horse uh, bounces up and down for a couple of minutes and child has a good time riding it. Well, we set it up so that in order for this to run, a child has to be over here pushing this lever at a certain frequency. So if he pushes it maybe once a second, let's say, then it provides the power for this. So one child can be riding while the other one's providing the power for that to happen. They have to learn cooperative sharing. And we found that to be really, really helpful as a mechanism for developing that and, and rewarding and reinforcing that, that particular uh, skill. Okay. <clears throat> Seizure disorders. Now remember again that autistic kids are very vulnerable. Uh, or I should say there's a higher probability of, of uh, ASD children being uh, susceptible to seizure disorders. And this is what it looks like. Uh, again, up over the theta, uh, up over the uh, sensory motor cortex at location CZ, theta beta ratio 3.1, we want it below 2.5 or so, theta SMR ratio 6.13, there's your vulnerability to seizures. <clears throat> Back of the brain, <clears throat> elevated, so gets into fugue states, and the Hyperactivity of the anterior cingulate gyrus is huge. Okay, so we have multiple seizures. Uh, 
and, and uh, issues associated with the developmental delay, cognitive and social. You see the, the typical pattern that we see. Elevated alpha in the right relative to the left. Uh, marked elevation of the anterior cingulate gyrus. Elevated slow frequency up over the sensory motor cortex. And here's your low seizure threshold. Now, the problem that <clears throat> neurologists face is that if a child comes in with seizures, seizures can be a life-threatening condition. And they're between a rock and a hard place, as I've said. And that is, what do they do? Well, the only tool they have available, really, uh, are anti-seizure medications. Now, the problem with anti-seizure medications is that they slow things down, which is why they work. And in this case, we can see that there's a marked elevation of slow frequency up in the front part of the brain. And we commonly see this with, uh, uh, el with uh, uh, medication, anti-seizure medication. So it really can delay, inhibit the frontal cortex. So it affects uh, cognitive development, it affects uh, uh, skill acquisition at appropriate uh, age-related developmental stages and so forth. So one of the number one priorities when we're working with ADD, uh, I'm sorry, ASD kids with seizures is to get them off the seizure medication, which means, of course, that uh, we treat the seizure issue before we treat the autism issue in a kid that has seizures that have to be maintained control with medications. Now, the book by Arlene Mattel talks very specifically about that because Adam had seizure disorder and autism, and if uh, you'll read in that book that the first thing I went after with Adam was the seizures, and he responded remarkably quickly. We got it under control very fast. Okay. <clears throat> so when we're dealing with seizure issues, this is what we're dealing with in this area of the brain and contralaterally on the other side, uh, same sort of thing. In this area of the brain, we're dealing with elevated slow frequency and deficiency of the sensory motor rhythm. Uh, and we have a huge amount of research talking about the efficacy of doing that kind of training for controlling seizure problems. Somebody was asking about music. Well, we actually capture uh, the cadences in terms of uh, some Mozart compositions in one of our harmonics referred to as Mozart. And what we find uh, with this particular uh, way, uh, with this particular product, this particular uh, uh, harmonic, is that it increases the sensory motor rhythm. See, it goes from 5.6 to 6.3, and it decreases theta amplitude. So it's a very nice reduction in the theta SMR ratio. And we use this quite frequently with kids that have seizure problems uh, who also are, uh, and have uh, ASD. This happens to be a 50-year-old epileptic uh, lady. OK. <clears throat> We don't do electrical stimulation of kids, but I just want to show you something to point out that when, if you're going to have your child treated, you want to make very sure that who you're dealing with is somebody who has training experience, not only in neurotherapy, but also in some other health-related profession. And that and they are not doing one-size-fits-all anything. It's all guided and measured by brain measurements. This is a situation in which we were stimulating, electrically stimulating a point on the arm designed to uh, quiet the individual. Now, what I'm trying to show you here is 
we were looking at what was going on right on top of the head. Now you can see that stimulation increased slow frequency, amplitude, didn't change the sensory motor rhythm very much at all. But we have a situation in which the theta SMR ratio increased by 50%. Uh, if this person were vulnerable to seizures, then we would have markedly reduced the seizure threshold. You have to, have to, have to measure what, you, what you're doing with these children in terms of any kind of intervention designed to change brain activity. One size fits all treatment of this, uh, these children is simply malpractice. Okay, something you can do at home. <clears throat> this is referred to as EFT or emotional freedom technique and what it is is mildly stimulating acupuncture points and what we have found is that this can be very, very effective for increasing the sensory motor rhythm for kids that have seizure issues. Now, when I was first introduced to this, I thought this made, gave nonsense new meaning. It you know, just seemed pretty silly to me. But I brain mapped it, and I was really surprised at what it did. Now basically what you do is you start tapping on the edge of the hand. We call this the karate chop point for kids. And then on both sides, on the edge of the eyebrows, edge of the eyes, under the eyes, under the nose, under the chin, uh, under the collarbone, K27, kidney 27. And then what I call with the kids, the monkey tickle point. It's about four inches under the armpit. And you do that very rapidly. It takes you about five seconds to do the whole thing. About five taps in each place. And you can make it a game with the kids. Look what it does. This is the sensory motor rhythm. And this is where we started the EFT. And what it does is it changes the theta SMR ratio. And we get a nice decrease in the uh, theta SMR ratio. In this case, a decrease of 15.6%. Very, very nice. Okay. And we find that we get it in a lot of conditions so that it's pretty consistent. Uh, the average change, that is the average improvement increase in the sensory motor rhythm is about 26%. And this is for all kinds of conditions, epilepsy, autism, depression, and so forth. Okay, so then what the EFT does is in this area of the brain, decreases theta amplitude, increases the sensory motor rhythm. Okay. For individuals interested in uh, uh, the professionals who are listening, who are interested in any workshops that we give, uh, Rita has pointed out that uh, we are preparing our fall schedule. And if you want to be placed on the registration list, just give uh, Rita a call. I'm sorry, uh, send her an email at Rita at SwingleAndAssociates.com. And the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, has a lot of offerings. Uh, you can, for professionals, you can get from six to 42 hours of continuing edu education uh, credits. And we do both online and we do on-site uh, workshops. Uh, there's also a webinar series available through Biofeedback Foundation of Europe in which I give the same kind of webinar that I'm doing right now <clears throat> through their auspices and the next one uh, we're dealing with with them is in fact seizure disorders and you can find out about that by going to their website bfe.org. For uh, 
uh, professionals who are interested in the uh, way we do the brain assessments, there's the clinician's guide. And you can go to our website, soundhealthproducts.com. Okay, we have uh, one minute left, so I would actually like to address one question that um, few people are asking. How is Asperger's diagnosed, or how would I know I have autism? Well, <clears throat> uh, if you're looking at brain activity, then the Asperger's child has elevated slow frequency in the back of the brain, and they have that disparity in the front part of the brain in which the alpha is considerably greater on the right relative to the left. Now you can have autistic-like or Asperger-like characteristics. Uh, we have a lot of folks, uh, you know, the, the notion that uh, our computer geeks really have a bit of uh, Asperger's, which is from uh, their perspective, very beneficial. That is, it is a skill, the ability to focus in that kind of situation, uh, uh, the uh, attractive nature of being able to interact with people without having to uh, interact with them uh, face to face. Uh, that may be a job made in heaven for uh, an Asperger's, uh, that is a person with Asperger's-like symptoms. The label really is so unimportant. Uh, what you want to do is, uh, if you feel that there are there are conditions or behaviors or thought processes that are giving you some grief, then do an assessment and find out whether there's any neurological condition that's associated with it. Uh, social awkwardness does not mean you're autistic or uh, have Asperger's. It simply means that there's an area of the brain that's not working efficiently. Uh, now, the typical method for diagnosing these things is not based on brain activity, it's based on behavior. So uh, if you need the diagnosis of uh, autism for funding, for example, they do not depend on brain activity for that diagnosis. That diagnosis comes from your describing those behaviors to a pediatrician or pediatric neurologist who, based on your definition, uh, your description of those symptoms, will offer that diagnosis. Well, this concludes our webcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and you will join us again on May 7th. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Swingle, and we will see you next time.